we'll get to what we have this morning. Father, um, I just thank you for the moment this morning of just sitting in contemplation, uh, maybe, of your glory, how majestic you are, how above us you are, how great you are, magnificent you are. It's, it's humbling, certainly. It can be a little frightening, if I'm honest. But it's also remarkably inviting. We're not used, we're not used to glory stooping. We're not used to glory welcoming. We're certainly not used to glory giving of themselves and setting it aside to become like us and to die in our place. Like, God, you are fascinating. A kind of um, humility, a kind of um, generosity, a kind of love that we don't know. And yet you invite us to know. I, um, man, I'm just really glad just glad. I pray to be with us this morning as we wrap up our series. Uh, and I pray that this uh, time we've spent these last few weeks is, it will bear great fruit. I pray for um, our groups as they get started this week. And I pray for just great ministry and care and connection and community uh, in this season. I pray that there are those uh, who are new that are able to maybe lean into community for the first time here and it's scary. And I pray, God, that you would just bless them and you would provide them courage, uh, but then you would bless them and quickly with that, um, that reach. God, I just thank you for those who are returning to group and, and I just pray that you would bless them in this season pray that relationships are rekindled and new connections are made as, as new people are added to groups. and It's exciting. I pray that you would bless, uh, bless our groups as they get going. Thank you for our time this morning. Be glorified and, and, and through it, would you also encourage us? In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, where's Tyler? This he put four donuts in front of me. I'm supposed to preach with four donuts in front of me this entire time. All I smell is maple. I can't. No, I can't. <laughs> no, no. I think we should just close in prayer. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, we're talking about, and have been these last many weeks, we're talking about the importance of genuine community in the life of a church. And one of our values, as we keep stating over and over again, is community matters. Related to that is another value, family manner matters. It's nuanced a little bit, but it's, it's, it's similar and certainly overlaps, but community matters. Uh, community, we said in week one, quoting Willis in his book, Life and Community, he said this, I think this is a, a powerful quote, especially understanding the history of the church. Community is more than a Sunday and mission is more than a trip. If you have history in the church and church, there, you have tradition in the church, that's a powerful statement. If you're new to the church, you might go, I don't understand. But if you've been around the church, that's a powerful statement. Community is more than just attending on a Sunday morning. And mission is more than once in your lifetime. Maybe when you were in high school or college, you went on a mission trip once. Mission is more than just a trip. And so it's calling us to a different kind of life and a different kind of living. So when we talk about community matters and the importance of community in the life of the church, we're not talking about, you know, uh, get your butts in church on Sunday. Uh, sure. It's not that community doesn't happen in this space, but it's more than this space. An hour, it's more than this space. That's what, that's what he's talking about. That's what we're talking about. And so the question we need to ask is, and we've been asking since week one, is do you have a church without true community? We're talking about the importance of genuine community. So the question then is, do you really have, understanding what, what the church is by definition, do you have a church apart from genuine community? 
I don't know how you, how you could. It's, it's a particular thing. It's a particular thing. And apart from community, I don't know how you have that thing. And so we think about the, the use of the word church in our culture. And, and, and our definitions maybe would work with outside, outside of genuine community, but I don't think a biblical definition does. The church is not an institution, though it was instituted and by Christ. The church is not an organization, though clearly in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, it is to be organized, but it's not an organization primarily. Church is not a form of government, though leadership matters. It, it's to be governed, but it's not a form of government. It's not a location. That's how we most commonly use it. It's down at the church. Okay, we, we, we think of it. it it's, it's not a location, though hear me on this one, because in a digital age, I think this, this is important. It is to be located, though. You see what I mean when I'm saying that? I don't think it's enough. This is the conflict we've had with this streaming. This is the conflict I have with streaming services for, for church services. It's to be located. A church is a gathering. It's, it's not just this online relationship or a digital relationship. I listened to a podcast. Didn't make church. Let me listen to a podcast this week. No. It's not. A church isn't a location, but it is to be located. Because it's a, it's a gathering and a particular gathering. Anyway, that's another sermon. Church is not a building. There's another common use, uh, uh, though it, because it's a gathering, it requires space. We see that in Scripture as well. We need space to meet. You go back to the tabernacle, the temple, and then the synagogues, and then you even have uh, Paul having to move church from a synagogue to, to a hall, to find a hall big enough for the gathering because they were pushed out of the synagogue. So it has space needs. If it's a gathering, it has space requirements, but it's not, a, it's not the space. It has space requirements, but it's not the space. You see what I'm saying? So you see why true community is so important. And, and what, more than that, it's essential to the life of the church. By definition, genuine community is essential to it. And so I've argued before that you cannot do much of what Scripture commands you to do, us to do, as followers of Jesus apart from genuine community. What do I mean? How many commands in Scripture are there that have the phrase one another in it? I have a list. It's not exhaustive, although in my notes it looks somewhat exhaustive. Uh, love one another. It's John, Romans, 1 John. Encourage one another. I'm not going to read you all the text. For that, 1 Thessalonians, Hebrews. I got all sorts of, <laughs> this is a lot. Okay. I'll just rattle down the list. Love one another. Encourage one another, greet one another, be of the same mind toward one another, be at peace with one another, build up one another, serve one another, regard one, one another as more important than ourselves, accept one another, bear one another's burdens, care for one another, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, confess our sins to one another, and then in many places we're told not to judge, sue, boast, envy, or complain against one another etc., etc., etc. Apart from genuine community, you can't do much of what God asks us, uh, no, commands us to do as his disciples. So again, apart from genuine community, I don't know what you have. I don't know if you can call it a church where there is not Christ-centered, genuine, authentic. It's a particular community, don't mishear me, but genuine community I don't know if you have a church. Um, I'm sure all of you played hide and seek when you were a kid. Some of you uh, uh, play hide and seek now. I play it as a grandpa. Okay, so uh, hide and seek. If, if you're, there was a phrase at the end of the game. Do you remember? Somebody would call it out. What is it? Ready or not. Oh, okay, that's, another, that's, that's the start of the game, not the end of the game. Ready or not, here I come. End of the game is what? Yeah. What on earth is that? I Googled it. Nobody knows. I Googled. Okay, I've got some ideas, but it is not definitive. Okay, so uh, some say it's a garbled form of all ye, all ye, outs in free. 
So it just kind of got mumbled together, I guess. It's some form of all ye, all ye outs in free. Okay, whatever. Others speculate that it's German, alle, alle, ach sind free. Uh, loose translation is all, all are now also free. Uh, and still others think the origin might be Greek. Uh, everybody, everybody out. <laughs> Eloi, Eloi, exo. Everybody, everybody out. Nobody knows for sure what its origin is, but we all know what it means. Everyone can come out with no penalty. You don't have to be afraid to come out. You can come out and not lose the game. I think when we're talking about genuine community, I, I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about everybody come out of hiding without fear. That's scary. That's scary. But if we're to confess our sins, I mean, I can go back and do that list again if you want. Should we? You see? Genuine community that, that we are known and in very vulnerable ways of these, this is where I struggle. This is what hurts me. This is the pain I've experienced in very real ways to be known. And then it's not just the courage it takes to be known. It takes courage to know because when someone shares that kind of stuff with you, what do you do with it? Now you got to contain it. Like, I don't know. what They told me that. Like, I'm glad they were able. What do I do with that now? You ever felt that? There's a responsibility to be the hearer, the knower in a relationship when someone desires to truly be known. That's not just the courage it takes for the, the one who's looking to be known. It's, it takes courage to know, to be willing to sit with somebody through all their stuff that makes you uncomfortable and to contain it and to love and to lean in and tell me more and, and, and what do you need? And see. It's, it's, it's big. So the call to genuine community is a call to come out of hiding without fear of losing the game. And, and, and that's hard and, and certainly frightening. So we wrap up the series today. This is uh, week six. I hope, if you've been here for most of them, that, that it has been a, a biblically compelling case of why community is important. Why community matters makes the list of, of values, stated values of our church. I hope it's been a compelling case. I hope to see people courageously get connected in a group and, and lean in in this season uh, at Valley Life uh, to a greater degree. And somebody say, well, I've been around here for a long time. I'm connected. I go to a group. Well, even for you, I would say, what does it look like to be courageous and, and lean in more? I think everybody, whether you've been in a group for years or not, could lean in more. So I hope you've been challenged through this. Today, this one's challenging for me, this subject, and we're gonna end with it. And I get to be uncomfortable the last, the last uh, uh, day of the series. Um, over the course of the series, I've had some uh, of our leaders up here to have a conversation with me at the end. And there are some that just don't wanna do that, and I, I can fully appreciate that. <laughs> it's just scary to be up here. I get it. So I, I wanna, those of you who did, I wanna commend your courage. Those of you who didn't, I completely understand. Like, I feel up home, at home up here, and so sometimes I, it, it's lost on me what I'm asking you to do when I'm asking you to join me, because this is not a big deal for me. In fact, I am more comfortable here right now than I am saying hi to you in the hallway before church. <laughs> that freaks me out. I'm like, I can feel muscles in my face trying to hold smiles. Like, I don't know how to be in that space. I can do this space just fine. And that's a particular gifting I have, and so maybe it doesn't require as much courage for me as for others. Well, today turns the tables on me a little bit. Because what we're talking about today is harder for me. And, and some of you are just shine at it. And this is, this is, again, the beauty of the church, how God gifts us differently for the common good so that we have what we need as a body. We have all the things doing their things so that we can be a full, a full body, a healthy body. And, and some of you are just remarkable at this. And I watch you and I go, I wonder what that would be like. You know, um, there's, I suppose at some point there's, there's envy. I wish I could do that better. I wish I could do this better than I do. So there's my confession. So what are we talking about? 
hospitality. That doesn't mean I don't know how to fold a napkin, although that is still true. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to fold a napkin. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about hospitality, particularly biblical hospitality. We open the series, we've referred to it many times. Willis has a line that I think is really, really good. He says, the church is meant to be a table. And that captures a particular imagery. That's why we've got the table up here and the series is called Come to the Table. Like this inviting environment where people are welcome to sit around it and to, after the meal, kind of lean into that space and get to know one another. The church is meant to be like this, a table. And we've kind of redefined it to be more in this kind of transactional relationship where you've come to get from me something. You show up, did you get something, did you not? Oh, well, there's always next week, and then you leave. Like, the church is not meant, no, I mean, there's environments where this takes place and must take place because other things matter too. But community matters requires kind of, this is the imagery. This is, the church is meant to be a table. And you get this picture of intimate, communal uh, relationship. The nature of the church is communal and, and intimately communal. And a table fits that better than, than, than an audience and a platform. It's meant to be a table. That's the idea. But that has family implications. Again, family matters. I mean, we could talk about that, and we have been these last several weeks. But it doesn't only have family implications. Doesn't a table also have implications for guests That's what we're talking about when we're talking about hospitality. We're not talking about fancy napkins and place settings and centerpieces and plates full of donuts. We're talking about welcoming guests, particularly strangers. And for, for some, that's, oh yeah, man, that, all day. And for others, it's like, man, I'm awkward. I, my mind goes blank. I can't remember question. you know. People say, well, they get up on the platform and their mind goes blank. No, man, I have all sorts of crazy thoughts when I'm up here. It's just, it's a place I can free speak. I'm comfortable. It's not a big deal. We can have a conversation. I get in a hallway and I'm like, uh, 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 sun's out. <laughs> It's painfully awkward. I feel like I should apologize to all of you. Okay. We have this, uh, in our culture, it's difficult to talk about hospitality because we have this, uh, hospitality uh, culturally is is fixated on the home. And I think there are certainly pieces of the home that are a part of it that I don't want to get, I don't want to get lost. But I'm not talking about the place where we dwell. I'm talking about the home we're always improving It's an altogether different thing than the place where we live that we're inviting people into. It's now become this weird sort of extension of ourselves to be accepted in life. It's more about us than anyone. And it's been going on for a long time. I I get it. I mean, some of you will remember Tim Allen's Home Improvement. Remember that show, Home Improvement? Okay, all the power tools and all the things. You know, I mean, it's been on the rise for some time since the 80s, at least in my lifetime. I remember Bob Vila in this old house. Okay, now that was a little different because that seemed to be, there was an artistry to that and craftsmanship to that that was really, I suppose, fun to watch. It maybe wasn't as much an extension of, 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 of me, but you add to that, you know, all the reality shows, the fixer upper, the design on a dime. I mean, I, the list is, is endless. And all of a sudden, our homes are like the accessories we wear, the way we get dressed in the morning. So how are people going to view me and see me? And it, it's more about me. So when we talk about hospitality, it's, it's welcoming people into that space. Well, okay, well, then what does that mean? Well, I got to learn how to fold napkins and got to make sure because when they come over, I got to make sure it's the best me that they see, which is all about you and not about them. So functionally, it's not biblical hospitality at that point. It's some twisted version where our insecurity are swelling and we're constantly and frantically trying to make up for them so that people will accept us and not really know us and ah uh, you tracking with me okay okay some of you are like oh my goodness you just outed me big time okay yeah i get it. like seriously it's 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 epidemic i think culturally um 
man, I could say a lot about that. I, even in my own life, uh, the ways that we compensate for the fears of, uh, of being known. Social media doesn't help. It's an, it's an ability for us to have total control on what people know about us. So yeah, I'm known, but I'm only known in a customized way, in a tailored way, not in an authentic way. And our homes are kind of like that. And then people get in them and, and then they get messed up or they, you know, we got to make, we're constantly entertaining, which again is not so much I think about welcoming guests as much as it is the hors d'oeuvres were great, that this was, the, and they're going to think great about m me when they leave. Do you remember their name and who you even had over? Culturally, we've got a lot of work to do here in that application. Um, so much attention is on the place itself and not on what that place is for. Biblical hospitality has no issue with comfort. Uh, it has no issue with a, a place being a refuge. I get that. How many of you come home? Like, for me, I'm an introvert. My home is like where I go, how many, you like, you're there with me? Okay. And I just don't necessarily want people there. There are times when I am laying on the couch and between, I don't know, my second or third nap, and someone knocks on the door, which doesn't happen in our context very much these days. People don't just drop by. They'll text you first, but somebody will knock on the door. And I don't know. I, I, I don't think any of my kids are here. I don't want them to actually videotape me doing this, but I want to see video of how quickly I sit up and look presentable because it's awkward to be found sprawled out on the couch, you know, and, you know, and uh, quickly jump. Like, uh, so look at biblical hospitality has no problem with a home being comfortable. It has no problem with a place feeling like a refuge. It's very compatible. Biblical hospitality is, is very compatible with the idea of refuge and comfort, even worship. Although when you th we think about our home being a place of worship, there's an idolatry issue there, but I think there's a beautiful worship element even in biblical hospitality that I think can be beautiful. So it doesn't really have a problem with that. Um, I think the issue is, is who it's for. If it's only a place of comfort for you, if it's only a place of refuge for you, if it's only a place where worship takes place for you, that's where biblical hospitality is going to apply some pressure. Because biblical hospitality would, would ask, who else might it be a place of comfort for? Who else could it serve as a refuge for? And who else could be invited into a space of worship? See? So it's a who question. Biblical hospitality doesn't push necessarily on those other things, unless I suppose it's idolatrous. But it understands the home as, uh, as a comfort, as a refuge, as a place of worship. It understands those things and welcomes. It's just who's it for? In our culture, it's, it's for me. Even when guests are over, it's still for me. What does it look like for our places to be places of... We had, we had somebody... Uh, people come out to the property. My wife uh, grows flowers and, and has been pursuing her dream of flower farming these last few years. And she just has some beautiful flowers out in the field. And so it's not uncommon these days for people to come over and want to take pictures in the field. And so we have people there often that are taking pictures in the field and senior pictures or whatever, couples picture, family pictures. And somebody recently uh, responded and just said, man, just, just being out there was so peaceful. And I told my wife, I said, it is so wonderful when people it, almost verbatim say what we hoped this place would be. That provided peace and shalom for someone else. In some cases, strangers, people I don't know out in my field taking senior pictures. Who's it for? That's biblical hospitality. Who else could this be a place of comfort and refuge for? 
I, I'm compelled to say I, I'm a, that I think for many of us, we have to be honest about whether or not home is even a refuge for us. And that's another sermon, but it needs to be said. For some, home does not provide that for you. And there isn't peace, and there isn't comfort, and there isn't refuge. And I'm compelled to say that out loud. Again, it points out the need for spaces that people can be invited into that are comforting, that serve as a refuge, and that meet them with where they're at. How awesome if people have dysfunctional homes and painful environments to be able to be in other spaces because someone else welcomed them in. You see? This isn't about folding napkins, guys. This is the welcoming of a glorious God on display. Ah. Oh. We'll continue through Romans 12 if you're following along. We're, uh, we've been working through Dustin Willis's outline uh, in his book, Life and Community. So this is a tool we use for our groups. Uh, and he just biblically unpacks, uh, he lays a biblical foundation of, of why community is so important in the life of the church. And he's primarily working through the book of Romans. I'm throwing in some other texts. I'll do that again today. Supplement it a little bit. But he's working through these markers of community in Romans 12. And there's a long list of them. This is what it should look like when the body of Christ gets together. And he rattles off a ton of things. And we've been working through some of those. And it continues today. Look at this. This is Romans chapter 12. Now we're in the first the second part of verse 13. It just simply says this, four words. Seek to show hospitality. What a silly verse if this is about napkins. You see? And centerpieces and place settings. Although that has a lot to do, I suppose, in comfort and shalom, and there's beauty in all of that. So I don't want to take that entirely away. But for us, most of the time, it's not those things. It's, it's more about facade and how people see me. And so if it's really a pl- art and craft that just creates kind of a comfortable environment and a refuge, then, then I don't want to take that entirely away. But what a silly verse if it's only about that. Seek to show hospitality, or, or depending on your translation, pursue hospitality. It's a command to, to, to seek after it, to pursue it. Pursue what? Well, welcoming, particularly guests and strangers. Willis says this in his book, uh, in reference to uh, Romans twelve thirteen. Life is rhythmic. And Paul argues, again, Romans 12, that hospitality is the practical outworking of the gospel into the rhythms of our everyday lives. We practice hospitality when we consistently receive others into our lives and homes in the same fashion as Christ received us. Okay, that's that stooping I talked, to with, uh, I talked about at the, uh, the opening of the morning. Just infinitely glorious. And the more we try uh, to comprehend his glory, the, the, the greater the gap is and, and, and the bigger the stooping. What it means to say that the almighty God creator of the world welcomes you in by faith to be a part of, a member of his household. It's, it's just re- Remarkable. And this is what, this, these aren't necessarily special moments. I love the term rhythmic, and I, this is where I struggle. I, I ha, it's not that I don't have people at my home, but is there a rhythm of it? Man, I, I you know, I, whew, as an introvert, I tend to just, my space, get out of it, right? It's the rhythm, the in and out of each other's lives, it's, There's a rhythm to it, and that's something we see through our community groups that's so beautiful to watch, down to who's got whose kids and who's picking up what for them and who's running it and who's and the crossing and the coffee and the play dates and the things. There's a rhythm to it. It's not just about another night on the calendar. 
How many nights you want us to give, Pat? No, there's a rhythm that we're inviting you into. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, turn there. I'll try to speed up. I've been digressing too much. Ephesians chapter 2, this is a, a tough passage to just drop into because the, the storyline here is pretty big. Uh, but we've studied Ephesians not too long ago, so I'm going to risk it. Um, we've walked through this passage not too long ago uh, at great length, and so we're going to drop into it. But I want you to look, look at it particularly as relates to hospitality. Look at chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 12. What did I say? Oh, Hebrews is next. We're in Ephesians now. Sorry. Hebrews is coming. If you're already there, uh, put, uh, put a finger there because we'll be at Hebrews in a minute. We're dropping into a couple of different places. First one's Ephesians chapter 2. Sorry. Verse 12. Look at this. As relates to hospitality. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. So speaking about that time when we were dead in our sins, before we knew Jesus. So remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated, that's important, from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers, that's important, to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So that's where you were. And Paul says, remember that. It's not a little piece in the scope of understanding hospitality to remember your own need for it. Look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought, what? Near by the blood of Christ. So he did something on the cross by propitiating sin and dying in our place for our wickedness, it made it possible for us to be invited back into intimate communal relationship with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which we had in Genesis 1 and 2 before Genesis chapter 3 in our sin, which then we had to be removed from the garden, if you remember the story. And then all this work as God planned to send a redeemer, Jesus, who would take care of the sin problem so that we could be invited back into the garden because God is motivated out of love for us to welcome us. And Paul says the first thing in this idea of, of, of unity in the church, which is the bigger narrative here in Ephesians chapter 2, is to remember that we were once far off and were in great need of being invited near. And then Jesus did that. And that should then be and serve as the motivator whereby we invite others to draw near. To what? To, to, to the table. Remember that you were once far off and, then, and you've now been brought near. You see, community matters. Community matters. Jesus has invited us in. So now when you look back at Romans 12, it says, like, seek to show hospitality. We go, oh, I get it. I think I'm understanding a little more. Yeah, seek it. Pursue it. Man, in light of Ephesians 2, that's helpful. Now Hebrews, chapter 13. Again, I'm supplementing Willis here. So I'm trying to move quickly. Hebrews chapter 13, not far from, it's forward, if you're new to scripture from Hebrews, uh, excuse me, from Ephesians, uh, but it's not far from it. Hebrews 13, look at verse one. Let brotherly love continue. Hmm. Hmm. Let brotherly love continue. Similar to what we saw back in Romans 12, let your love be genuine, remember? And then now seek to show hospitality. So let this continue. Seems pretty straightforward. Okay, brotherly love. Let's, let's continue that. Just four words, but think about it for a second. It's a couple things that, that are worth noting, I think. First of all, uh, who are we talking about? He uses the word brothers. Uh, who are we talking about? Well, 
Christian brothers and by extension sisters. He's talking about the, the family of God. And so he wants us to love one another. Okay, well, we've seen those passages. We've treated that already earlier in this series. Uh, we should love one another. I want my kids to love one another. Okay, makes sense. But what kind of love are we talking about? And this is the second observation from this first verse in, in Hebrew, Hebrews 13. Are we talking about a feeling? I think reducing love to an emotion, a feeling, is a mistake, is an error, especially biblically, it's an error. Uh, does it have emotion tied to it? Certainly, but I, I think to reduce it to an emotion is a miss. It's more than that. The word the author uses in Hebrews 13 is, is Philadelphia. Now, you're familiar with Philadelphia, the city of what? City of brotherly love. Okay, so you, you get the compound word there in the original language, in the Greek language. The first word is Adelphos, Philadelphia, brother. And the other is phileo or, or phylos, which is a loved one, or phileo, to love with that brotherly type affection. So more specifically, it's to manifest an act or a token of affection. So it's, it's more than just a feeling. It, it, it is a manifestation of. And so it's an act. I think love is more, uh, uh, biblical love is, is more in common with an action than, than just a feeling. So let brotherly love, Philadelphia, continue. So I, I, I see this on display most obviously in our community groups Family camp is another place. It's just on full display, church. It is remarkable to watch. Uh, I love it, and, and, and uh, it's fun to observe. It's fun to be a part of. We're just caring for one another and watching out for each other's kids and the actions, the actions, the needs that, become, that people become aware of and around fire pits over the course of the weekend. People hear, well, I didn't know you were moving. I didn't know that you were Well, how can I do it? And then all of a sudden, people are doing stuff. They're acting. Man, that's on full display in our community groups. It's on full display at some of our Community Matters events. Uh, family Camp is certainly one of those. There should be a lot of that going on. Seek to show that kind of hospital. Love one another. Let that continue. And church, listen, yes. <laughs> we want that to continue. And not just continue, what? Grow. I'm sure we could all grow. I know I can. And, and, and I've got a lot of room here. Where did I leave off? Oh, Peter adds to this. Uh, uh, don't turn there. First Peter 4, he says, show hospitality to one another. And the assumption is again within the church. And then he adds this, without grumbling. Show hospitality without grumbling. There's something else that God calls us to do without grumbling. Uh, giving. That God wants from us is cheerful. It, it, it's a place where we're at, where we're able to cheerfully and just glad to do it. I'm glad to serve. I'm glad to give. See, generosity is another thing where God's not just looking for people to do it. It's, man, I'm glad to be generous. I'm glad to, that's what he's saying. So he wants that to continue, okay? That's good. Man, yeah, that's enough of that for now. Okay, back. Uh, John 13, look at this on the screen. Jesus said this. A new commandment I give you, that you are to love one another just as I have loved you. It's weird when we just put a little description, just as I have loved you. Man, you could sit right there for a bit. How did Jesus love you? Love one another like that. Whoa. Okay, that's big. By this, verse 35, all people will know that you are my disciples. One, because it's a particular kind of love, right? It's a particular kind of love because we're to love one another like Jesus gave. It's by this you're gonna know that you're my disciples. Well, duh. Oh, that makes sense because it's, it's the kind of love that Jesus loved us with. Okay, and it puts that on display. Okay, back to Hebrews. Look at this. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. 
Okay, that's a lot. Uh, we'll hold on to that second part here. <laughs> I'll make a comment or two about that in a minute. But look at the first part. Do not neglect to show hospitality. In the first verse, he uses the word Philadelphia, and he's talking about brotherly love. In this one, he uses philoxenia. So there's a play on, there's related words in the Greek language here between hospitality and brotherly love. So one is particularly concerned with brothers and sisters within the church. The next one, verse two, is, is different than that. It's to show love, philo is still lo- show love to xena, strangers, aliens, foreigners. So in these first two verses in, in, in Hebrews 13, he's talking about, let this continue. He assumes it's already happening. If you're brothers and sisters in the church, I assume you're already loving one another. Continue to do that. But now what? Take that love and now show it outside the walls of the church. What does it look like to show it to those who are outside, who are strangers or foreigners, or it could also be translated guests. God desires that we include strangers. This is increasingly difficult in our culture, and I do not have all the answers here. But things are getting so crazy, it seems. Can I use that word? Is that it? That what it's doing is it's forcing us to be more tribal and more sectarian, more siloed. Um, we're just, we're just doing this, and we're backing up, and we're just getting with people who, have the same, who think like us, who act like us, who are more like us, and we're just like, man, it's getting weird. I'm just, okay. We're called to be welcoming to aliens and strangers, and what we're seeing is we're just huddling up, and the gap between us culturally uh, is just getting wider and wider, and I, I don't have... I was gonna say all the answers. There are some days I don't feel like I have any. Except I look at scripture and I say, I see, continue to show love, brotherly love. Okay, that, well that's, that one's easy in some sense. But also show love to strangers. Well that means I've gotta be out where strangers are. Uh-huh. But they're scary. I know. I don't understand completely. Yep. I don't really know. Uh, That's the point. What if they... I don't know. See? It's frightening. This is biblical hospitality. In the first century, uh, inns were... you, you, You didn't just go find a holiday inn and have a nice little weekend. Inns were... Places typically of ill repute. They were dangerous places. You could get robbed. They weren't, they weren't what we imagine inns today. And so this command had a practical purpose too. It's like when it's Christians are traveling and sometimes you need to welcome people into your home. They might be Christians. They might like welcome them into your home just to provide safety and comfort and refuge. So, they're not, so there's a practical piece to this, certainly in the first century. Just what does it look like to invite? Remember when Jesus sent out the disciples? He said, go and find a person of peace in that town and stay with them until you leave. If they're not welcoming, do what? Shake the dust off your feet and then move on to another place. Like it's quite remarkable. It has to do with hospitality and whether or not it's actually being granted or not. And we're commanded to show hospitality, to to pursue it, to seek it. Man, uh, there's a lot that could be said there practically. Then it says, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Okay, what are we supposed to do with that? Uh, first of all, I think I would say, and, and th- this helps me, I don't think we, we should overcomplicate it. People are like, man, I don't know if that person was an angel. And we come up with all these scenarios and we start imagining, what if they were? And then we're in, in the... I think let's just remember that this happened in the Old Testament. Remember angels came and visited Abraham in Genesis chapter 8. Lot had a couple of visitors, the same angel came and visited Lot in in the next chapter in Genesis 19. I think as as Hebrews, as the author of Hebrews is writing, I think he's just remembering that this has happened before. And look at, remember, Abraham made a meal and invited him to a meal. And and Lot showed hospitality and invited them in for refuge, if you remember, from, from violence and protected them from violence. And 
So in a, in, a, in a sense, the author of Hebrews could simply be saying, this has happened before, we've seen it. And biblical hospitality looks like it. And who knows, like Abraham, like Lot, you could have a couple angels in your house and you don't even know it. Either way, show hospitality. And in so doing, some have, Abraham and Lot, for example, have entertained angels without even knowing. I think the principle here is that we, through our hospitality, we're never quite sure what God is accomplishing what he's up to, what he's doing, and how he leverages our hospitality to those ends. So I think that's... Willis identifies six practical truths. I, I don't, I wanna be, I wanna wrap up here, but I don't wanna leave you without them, so I'll read them and keep my comments to a minimum, okay? First one is this, uh, hospitality is not entertaining. That entertaining word uh, has such weird connotations anymore. And all of a sudden we got a bunch of people taking upon themselves other people's enjoyment and fun. and like, it, It's just weird. And again, it's an extension of me. It's how did you like the dinner? Was, was, was the meal good? Do you remember this? How was the place? And you were, uh, okay. So there's a lot of interesting connotations culturally today to recognize that hospitality is not entertaining. Uh, Jen Wilkin in her, uh, I think it was a talk she gave or a blog she wrote, I can't remember. Uh, but she lists these things about entertaining versus practical hospitality. Entertaining is always thinking about the next course. Hospitality burns the rolls because it's listening to a story. Entertaining obsesses over what went wrong. Hospitality savors what was shared. Entertaining, exhausted, says, it was, really, it was nothing, really. Hospitality thinks it was nothing, really. A play on words there, but that's powerful. Entertaining seeks to impress. Hospitality seeks to bless. And so you get the idea. Hospitality is not entertaining as we understand it culturally. Secondly, hospitality is about an open life. That's scary, I know. He says this, hospitality says, yes, there is room in my life for you. This is, this is challenging to me. And it's easy for me to compartmentalize because my, my vocation is ministry. So it's easy for me to justify that I'm at work, I do ministry. When I'm home, I'm my own business and you should do the same, <laughs> okay? It's pretty easy from a flat platform to manage a pretty closed life. I've been there. I know that space far too well. Again, this is why this challenges me, but there is there room. Is there room for others in? That's good. You know, this has a lot to say. I think about personality types. How many extroverts are in the room? Okay, two hands. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Invite me up. <laughs> okay. Okay. There's a few, a few of those. Okay. Introverts. Okay. Here's, here's something I'm going to say. I, do, I don't have time and neither the, the mature thoughts for it yet. But I'm just going to say this. I think there's, there is an, a, a culturally, in the culture that we live, that we are having an increase of adapted introverts because social media is driving us from each other. And so I think there are probably more extroverts in the room than you'll admit, but, but we're becoming out of fear and, and, and digital expression. We're becoming, uh, there's a higher number, I think, of adapted introverts. Now, I, 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 that's all I'm gonna say there. I haven't read a study, nor have I published one. I'm just saying uh, a lot more of you raise your hands as introverts. I don't think that's naturally true. My wife has told me repeatedly, you used to be more fun. I, she would correct me if she was here. She was, it wasn't, you used to do fun, but I don't know. I was insulted. Okay. <laughs> but I think there is an adapted introvert that it warrants some thought. Uh, we're becoming comfortable by ourselves because we're becoming more comfortable with people seeing our digital selves than our actual selves. I think that's adapted anyway. But I think the call to hospitality uh, is not uh, personality dependent. Like extroverts... Uh, you, you go to, you make sure to welcome strangers. And the introverts will be over here to make sure you're doing it right. Um, no, God calls us all to that, and introverts and extroverts alike. And let me say this about the beauty of the church. 
I think Willis says this in his book, but he says, uh, introverts challenge us to go deeper. Extroverts challenge us to go wider. And that is how the church is a gift, how we're a gift to one another. Okay, we stretch one another. Introverts will drive us deeper. Extroverts will drive us wider. Okay, third, hospitality is a community project. Again, community matters. Showing hospitality is a community element. I'm gonna leave it there, uh, but we do this together. Four, hospitality can be planned or spontaneous. Again, introverts and extroverts serve us here. Uh, some of the more fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants people, you're a gift. You don't feel like a gift most of the time to me, but you are a gift. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, fifthly, hospitality is, is powerful. What a thing to say. We have no idea just providing space for someone to sit and find refuge and comfort in a conversation and a listening ear. The power. I think maybe we underestimate it. That's all I'll say there. And finally, uh, hospitality is worth sacrificing for. I don't know how many times I have drugged my feet into a gathering or a meeting or a community group, just I'm tired, I'd rather just be home, okay, and just so, so glad I went and took the time and so blessed. It's worth sacrificing for, I would say amen, amen, amen. I'm gonna close with this, the series out with this. And I'm just gonna, Here's the, the vision he's casting, and this is how he closes, uh, well, close to the ending of the book, but this is how he captures it. Imagine people who love one another enough that they will not allow any need to go unmet, that they will be truthful enough to confront and encourage each other no matter the cost. Picture a community that collectively finds joy even in the midst of tragedy. This is what happens at a table marked by love. Cities transformed by the simple obedience of a small group of Christ followers or put others' needs above their own. Whew. Can you see it? A table where people bring their wins, their losses, their burdens, their tears, their gifts, their questions, and their pains while serving others who bring their wins, their losses, their burdens, their tears, their gifts, their questions, and their pains. It's a beautiful table to belong to and to give to. Can you see it? I would argue if you've tasted it, you're, this is more than something you observe from afar. Uh, and you talk about the epidemic of loneliness in our culture and context, uh, this idea of belonging to a table like that. What an invitation. That's the invitation to get connected in a community group. I hope you see it. It's not a do this to be a better Christian. It's an invitation to something particularly that we've been trying to paint a picture of over these last many weeks. This is an invitation to belong. Can you see it? That's the idea. Uh, Scott and Tina, Josh and Hannah, you guys wanna join me up here and we'll have a chat. Should be fun. You can have a donut too if you want to brave the pastor spit, preacher spit. <laughs> you think I'm joking? You should see my iPad every Sunday. <laughs> okay. All right. So appreciate you guys uh, coming up. And uh, Scott and Tina, you guys were leaders uh, years past, and then took a break, and you're busy doing uh, lots of other things, and then uh, reengaging this season as leaders again. So awesome. You guys are going to meet when? Sundays at what time? 5.30? You guys, when do you meet? Mondays at 6. Mondays at 6. Okay. Again, all that information is in that booklet that Eric kind of showed you guys earlier. Where is it? What? Oh. need one of these. This will help. Okay. Okay, so really quick at the outset, when we're thinking about this issue of hospitality, 
um, this issue of, of belonging. It's directly connected to this issue of belonging. So uh, when, I, when I think about this, um, we know there's a need to belong. What does that mean for us as humans? You think about your own story, the need to belong, and, and, and some of the fear about the, the opposite of that, not belonging. So speak to that for a minute. Speak to the need to belong and how hospitality sort of meets that belonging or that need for belonging. Who's going to lead off? That's a big one. Scott. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Uh, I think for me, personally, um, I, I work at nights, and so I'm alone a lot. I, I'm awake when others are sleeping, and I'm sleeping when others are awake. Uh. And uh, I, my peer group at work is only one other person uh, as we manage a whole shift. And so I feel like at times it's easy for me to be really lonely or get comfortable in being in that lonely space. Um, and so for being a part of a community group, it forces me to interact with others and had those relationships, and when I do that, I feel, or I realize I need those. And so I think, as gentlemen, I think, or guys, I think we kind of tend to be more towards that lonely aspect of things. Uh, we go out, we work hard for our families, and we, we guard and we protect, and then we come home, we seek that refuge in our own house. It's easy to do that all the time. So for me, uh, I need you in community with me. I need you in a group with me because I, I need to have that interaction. I need someone checking up on me. I need someone challenging me or praying for me as much as I need to pr provide that for others in a community mm. group. I think that uh, we've, we've said this before. I want to say this again because that's important. It's not just the call to get involved in community. is not just get involved because you need it. Did you hear what he just said? I need, I need you. The call to be a part of community is to take out God wired and gifted you and to be available for others, it's, it's the need others have of you, too, is a call to participate. I don't think that's little. And I would say, when you say, I'm awake when other people are sleeping and I'm sleeping when other people are awake, it's, it's those kinds of vocational issues we have as a culture that I think impact this adapted introvert. Um, that's something to, to consider and think about as we man, think about uh, how we're rhythmically sort of forced to, to work in the way that we do that. And You guys had anything? It's kind of more of the same, right? To when you feel like you belong, you feel needed too, right? Sure. And but there's a want. There's a portion of that where you feel wanted. Mm -hmm. When you feel wanted, you feel like you would be missed if you weren't there. Yeah. And that is what makes you f sometimes feel like you belong, because not not all of us necessarily need to feel needed in order to feel like we belong. Like some of us extroverts, right? But we want to feel wanted. Yeah. We want to feel like we were wanted to be there in the first place and that we would be missed if we weren't there. Let me ask, you guys want to be wanted? Like, I mean, it's a simple question. It seems like, oh, well, goodness, Pat, that's kind of personal. Like, seriously, you want people to want you around, right? And you want to be missed when you're not there? Yeah, I mean, you're, that's intrinsic, I think, to, to how we are wired. Anything else? Uh, to add to that, uh, looking at the point of view of just being part of the community group, not, not hosting, uh, my fear was, you know, obviously seeing if I belong here. Mm. Um, but also, um, in a way, when it comes to entertainment, I have this sense of trying to be everyone's friend and trying to please everybody. Uh. And it ends up becoming more of a, brings more anxiety and kind of uh, nervousness to myself. Um, and that was when I was, we were first coming to community groups. And then, uh, you know, throughout several years, and it does take time, it takes a lot of mistakes and struggles and learning about yourself and, sure. and your friendships and your relationship with God. Um, now being community group leaders, I kind of feel the same way, like I need to navigate everything, whereas I can just accept people into our home and, t and try to, in a way, um, kind of just be humble and show humility by 
actually not trying to be something I'm not uh-huh. and saying, hey, I have just, I have the same concerns and problems as a lot of people that come to our community, our community group. And I think that kind of that helps disarm whoever, if anyone's feeling like they got to kind of uh, uh, hold in their, their issues or their problems because they want to expose that out of fear of being judged or, or um, being like, you know, almost, it's, it's like high school kind of, <laughs> you, you know, you don't want to be the, the unpopular person, but when, when it comes to hospitality in our community group, it's, it's, that's all put aside. And it, it took, definitely took me a long time to get to that point because of just my introvertness and, uh, and just not being a very social person. Uh, now I have help. <laughs> um, but you're in trouble. Anyways, that's well, and I would say, I would say that too. It's like, how many of you carry an undue weight in and around other people having a good time when they're at your space? Like you're managing ever, like making sure. Uh, like I want to make sure if, if it looks people are like bored or you're like you take that responsibility. How freeing is it just to realize that everybody's a big boy and a big girl and can have fun or not? And I don't have. To, that's what I say. <laughs> I'm not good at it either, but I'm just saying. Let me, let me ask you guys this. Um, so we, we talked, uh, you know, we saw um, what Paul says in Ephesians, that remember that you at, one, at that time were alienated, but you've been brought near because of the blood of Christ. Talk about hospitality and the relationship of the gospel. That's, <laughs> that's not a little one, so I apologize ahead of time. But like just in your experience, as you demonstrate hospitality, that connection with, that direct connection with the gospel. I'll try not to talk the whole time since I'm the extrovert. But I think part of that is that you're willing to display your need, right? You were talking about that, Scott. Like part of showing the gospel is that you present yourself as needy as well. Now we have that in common. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah. that, that's be, sometimes that is what you need to do to be the hands and feet of Jesus at that moment is that you, you show that you also need Jesus. It's not that you need Jesus and you came to my house and there's no dishes in my sink, so I've got it together. It's like we both need Jesus and there's peanut butter on my table. Yeah. <laughs> you guys add anything to that? You're still, you're looking at me like, I don't know, that's a big question. Yeah, I could frame it, I suppose, a little better. Um, ask me it again. Well, it's just, it's speaking directly to, you know, what does the call to show hospitality tell us about the gospel? So if we're to seek and to pursue hospitality, what does that command tell us about the gospel itself? Maybe well, that's I think a better way to ask it. There's sacrifice in it. Um, there's fear mm. in it. Um, sacrifice being you, you want to open your home and you want to invite strangers in and, but there's risk in there. There's risk in being known mm. in the downtime of, we've hosted a lot of foreign exchange students. So literally we've had foreigners in our home from communist countries that we've invited in and you can't yeah. be like on guard for a year for a year with them um, we we had to let our guard down and be who we are in the battles in the in the messes in the i haven't cleaned the toilet in a month <laughs> in the pile of dishes in the sink and so in and you you can't have a mask on 24 hours a day so you risk being judged and you risk you just risk mm. a lot. And so, and the sacrifice is time sometimes. It's time, it's energy, it's, it's finances. It's not always, you know, cheap to provide coffee and snacks and creamer. <laughs> you know, those are little things, but weekly, I don't, and again, it's, that's just a little thing, but for some families and for some homes, that's, that's the sacrifice um, to provide that. And so, um, there's a lot of dependence on the Lord as you open your home on a weekly basis 
to love people when you don't feel like loving them. Or uh, maybe I just don't, I, the feeling needed, you know, when you host, sometimes, this is for me, I host a lot, and I, my job is I'm, I'm the lunch lady at East Lynn, and so I serve a lot of kids every day and provide a meal for a lot of children and adults. And so I have a tendency to get kind of busy when I'm hosting, and, and it's like the Mary Martha thing. And so I need, mm. I need my community. I need the people in my home or that I've invited in. Also, I want to connect with you. And I have a tendency, as I was reading this book, that I, my mental, I wasn't wanting it to be the entertaining. My motive wasn't to entertain, to be uh, invisible. But I found that I find myself getting busy. I got to make sure, you know, the water's full and the food's out and everyone's happy. And, and, I'm, and so this was convicting for me to try and be more intentional about I really do want to sit down and connect with people I have in my home, but sometimes it's hard for me. So, so here you go. If you're ever invited in my home and I'm busy in the kitchen, you haven't talked to me, come in and grab me and say, come sit down with me. Because I need that and I want that, but sometimes I don't allow myself to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Were you going to say, add something? Yeah, I think sometimes it's, we figure we got to get it all right. Like when you're sharing the gospel with somebody and you're so worried about how you say it or what you're going to say, and then depending, and then coming to the Lord is dependent upon how you say that. In reality, oh, yeah, it's the Holy yeah, yeah. Spirit working in their life. I think community group is a lot like that. We don't have to, we just have That's to open good. ourselves and make ourselves available and watch what God does. Because we don't know that person's story. We don't know the things that they dealt with or how God's been working in their life. But when they come into your home, it's meant for that place and that time right now. Yeah. And see what God does. You guys uh, mentioned, Josh, you mentioned a minute ago, too, some of the fears. You alluded to being known and coming and having the humility to be out in the open. You, same thing when you're talking about dishes and all the things. What are some of the other fears? When, when we're considering engaging in genuine community, what are some of the fears that are there pretty quick for you guys in terms of, of community? I'm not the best at holding a conversation, so there's a lot of awkward pauses and me making like faces, like <laughs> nodding my head and <laughs> looking around. And it's like it's just being socially awkward. <laughs> this is one of my fears. Okay, well, I appreciate your vulnerability there. That's awesome. Anybody else? Some of the fears that are right there at the top. I'm sure we could identify a lot, but for you, this one's kind of up at the top. I think chaos management, right? So it comes to some, you mentioned um, whether you can host or not. Mm -hmm. um, peop, when people picture, I, I know this because this is what I did back when we were asked to host and we weren't leaders. I was like, oh, I can't do that in my home. That's because I couldn't picture managing chaos and keeping control <laughs> in my home. And that, that's, yeah. you know, it's, it's real. You can't keep control of 18 little people under the age of eight. So now in my home while we host, I have to try and not white knuckle that and, and let that go. And part of that was, and I know some community groups choose not to do dinner together. Don't come at me. You can do your thing. But my motive for not doing dinner for years was that that's too many, too many things I can't control that. Like, that's too much chaos to feed that many people. We're not doing that. We're not going to do that. Letting go of that with some, I'm looking at you, Maddie, with some pressure from people that are like, well, you're not doing it. We are doing it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So <laughs> letting, letting go of those things and letting the shredded, shredded cheese hit the floor and letting go of some of those pieces and watching all these beautiful women sweep my floor and help me like that, that blesses me. Yeah. But if I would have held on to that fear, I'd still be in that, in that place. Avoiding it because yeah. you can't. Avo yeah, avoiding that's right. it completely, yeah. I think, I think that's a good reminder to everyone in groups. It's not just us leading, it's not just us providing, 
that we, we are a family when we're together sitting there, eating, sharing our heart, being vulnerable. So we can all come around and take ownership of dinner. We can all take ownership of picking up. We can all, we can help. We don't have to like create this chaotic mess and then leave and say, see ya. I mean, sometimes that happens and most of the time, I think for us, we're okay. It's like, that'll wait till morning. We can clean it tomorrow. It's not a big deal. But, but I can be helpful when I go into a home, my community group and, you know, how can I help? What can I bring? Um, so that's just, I think, a good reminder that we're all in it together and we're a family all together. That's right. So we can all help out. That's right. Anything else? I got one more. Okay. Thing. Wow, good for oh, you. Yeah. Really stepping out. <clears throat> uh, one of my fears is, um, how do I word it? So this is also one of my fears. I know I want to say, I know, I know what I want to say, but I can't verbalize it. Um, my fear is getting to a point where I feel like my own needs come first, mm. like almost even justifying that I need rest. I need a break oh, yeah. from, the, from a busy week, uh, or I justify it by saying I had a hard day at work. Um, maybe we should postpone group, uh, community group, or, or some, something like that. It's not really what's causing it, it's just me finding a reason to just basically be selfish with my time and my effort and energy and and that takes away from uh, the hospitality part of mm. well people belong want to feel belonging uh, like they belong and um, I don't know, I, I'm wrestling with that because yeah I, I understand that and also I'm getting to a point where I'm just listening to my, my own selfish needs. And um, I think that can be remedied by having community group because always at the end of community group, I don't regret having it. Yep. It's like, man, I needed that because I was, it was probably because I, I wasn't uh, focusing on my relationship with, with God and I was just getting so uh, wrapped up in work life or home life. And really, it's, it, it kind of helps rein me in and um, listen to what God's telling me. And it's part of it's having community group and yeah. getting to that point where, um, no, you, like you said, you need, you need to have some courage. Like, just uh, have community group, basically, and don't. Don't get so caught up in your, in these things where it's not it's not God that's telling you these things. You're you're having these fears because it's a lack of you turning to God, and community group is part of that. So. Well, it's interesting you you say you say, man, I'm really tired. I don't really feel up to it, and so you're recognizing need in you, and so that those needs that you have um, sometimes become the very barriers to the answer for those needs. And so, now, it doesn't mean, you know, that everybody always has what we need, but when you recognize those needs, you go, man, God is gonna provide, and often does, through my brothers and sisters in Christ. And those very needs I'm feeling right now make me want to not, because I'm just, ugh, but God's providing for my needs in that space. I, I, I think that's great. I wanna do this as we close. Um, we have, uh, so where are leaders? Uh, raise your hands, stand up if you're here. Well, raise your hand. I'm gonna make you stand up. Group leaders, okay, we got one in the back. Okay, we got a handful of them here. So this is what I, what I want you to do. I want you guys to go ahead and stand. I am gonna make you do it. Sorry, I apologize. I'm gonna uh, pray for our leaders. So if you're near them, uh, and, and would you kind of just reach up, put a hand on them or something gently and kindly. Uh, and then we're just gonna pray for our leaders and then pray for our groups as we close uh, this morning. This is a start of a new season and uh, 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 trusting that this was a good season of rest, but at the same time, we got a lot ahead of us. And even as I have you guys standing, 
uh, I recognize that it's not all about you, right? But, I, but I'm so grateful, we're so grateful for you stepping out and leading in this capacity, but it's not, it's not all about you, and it's okay to bring your needs to that space, okay? And so let's all stand together. Uh-huh.